I thought it was you, Mr. Masterson. Well, I'm glad to see you again. I gave you my last match. Want to lift any place on the way to the bus station? You talked me into it. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Ben Gibbs, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ready Robotics. We have created a software platform that enables people to use robots much more effectively than they can through tradi traditional means. Yeah, terrific. So let's come back to that in just, just a second. But going back to uh, your, your past work, work history, um, you've had worked at John Hopkins Technology Ventures. So I wanted to kind of understand what that experience was like. Yeah, it was a really formative experience for me. I was exposed constantly to all sorts of cutting edge technologies from organic electronics to novel drug delivery systems to surgical robots. In fact, that was how I was first exposed to robots in general was getting what amounted to private lectures from many of the super geniuses that are researchers and professors at Johns Hopkins one of whom, uh, Russ Taylor, is considered the, one of the founding fathers of surgical robotics. And there's a, a great robotics center at Johns Hopkins that really exposed me to a lot of what was happening in the industry. So, so in terms of kind of that transition from looking at just a wide spectrum of things and your kind of initial interest in robotics, that was more medical focused to industrial. Can you talk about that transition to how you, how you ended up at Ready, Ready Robotics? Yeah, absolutely. So while I was working in that office, I had the opportunity to meet my co-founder, Kel Guerin, who's the chief innovation officer of Ready today. And he was focused on the idea of making robots easier for people to use. He had just come from Carnegie Mellon where he had done his master's. And he came to Johns Hopkins, initially focused on surgical robotics. But one day, the university got a call from a local steel plant that had purchased some FANUC robots at a fire sale and realized that they didn't understand how to use them due to the complexity of the traditional interface. And so Kel went out there and visited, saw that there was this opportunity to make it easier, came to me and talked to me about it in my capacity in the tech ventures office. And we sat down and did a much broader survey of the opportunity and found that there was really a lack of focus in the industrial space on making these systems easier to use. And from there, the idea of Ready was born. So he asked me to consider leaving the university and I had been there for a while and was excited by the idea of being able to go deep on a particular problem. So we put together a pitch deck, went out and talked to some investors and eventually raised our seed round and the rest is history. Well, now you're on the other side of the, the spectrum uh, in terms of from, from investor to the startup founder. Uh, so this is actually a very interesting topic in terms of what you're bringing up, because uh, I think traditionally working with industrial robots have been really cumbersome. I mean, it's a, really a mess, a fragmented mess, to, to, to say the least. Uh, they use you know programming languages such as C++, Python, Java, C Sharp, .NET. Pascal. But the real issue is that everyone more or less kind of ends up using their own proprietary languages. Like ABB uses Rapid, uh, Rapid. Kuka uses KRL, uh, Yaskawa uses Inform, Kawasaki uses AS, and so on and so on. So you, you end up having this massive heterogeneous marketplace of closed gardens. And of course, uh, users and factory managers not able to really be able to do much themselves. Um, how does this friction result in economic costs for these manufacturers? So 
in a couple of ways. First and foremost, especially with manufacturers that have a heterogeneous robot fleet comprised of arms from different OEMs, that means they have to either have people on staff that can program in three or four different languages, or they have to rely upon systems integrators that know a specific language, and that alone is very costly. Secondarily, the time that is lost from having to struggle with that fragmentation translates into a very real economic burden for these companies. But finally, the really the biggest problem, I think, is all of this fragmentation makes it hard for innovative developers to come in and start to experiment with ideas that can rapidly scale up across the industry, much in the way that we've come to expect from the smartphone and the PC industries. And we've all seen the transformative effect of unifying software platforms there. Yeah, it's a really great point, especially in the context of COVID, where the demand and the uh, and the needs change so rapidly. Uh, to be able to actually be dynamic enough to respond to that quickly at on the factory floor, I mean that that's what really what we're talking about. And going back to this notion of of uh, really the kind of the underlying I think movement that's been out there is this open source project such as the Ross Industrial. That's been helping to, you know, create the interoperability between the industrial robotic platforms, and and leveraging the ROS, you know, software. Can you talk about um, what exactly is Ready Robotics doing in the area of universal operating systems, specifically for industrial automation? Yeah. So the work that ROS has done over the last decade is extremely important, and the overall message that they bring to the industry is a valuable one. That you need to have standardized approaches to accessing these robot systems. What we've done is created a set of standard APIs that allows you to interface with a growing number of robot platforms, but also more importantly, the peripherals that go with them as well. So when you get a robot arm, it actually can't do much. It can move around, but it can't pick up anything. It can't sense the environment. So there's a tremendous amount of integration work that typically goes into this process of setting up a system. And if you don't have that experience, you have to bring in one of these systems integrators. And so what our software platform has done is created that uh, interconnectedness that makes this experience much more plug and play. So instead of having to write a custom driver so that your force sensor or your vision system is talking properly to your robot arm, you can use our pre-built drivers that uh, are just ready to go out of the box. So what you're talking about is, I believe, your product, one of your products, Forge OS. That's correct. That allows for users to be able to drag and drop. It's a flow chart programming interface that just, I guess, allows for just about anybody on the factory floor to be able to actually do this without the need for system integrators. So my question is, for the, the manufacturers of these robotic arms, um, what's their position? Do they feel like this is actually helping to increase adoption and usage? Or do they feel like it's taken away from the revenue stream? Or was that really meant for system integrators anyways? Yeah, so there are a number of robot companies out there that are very supportive of these type of platforms. There are many that are signed up with Ross Industrial, for example, and there are many that are supporting the work that we're doing. We work very closely with a number of the major robot arm OEMs. Ultimately, we all see a future where we need more robot arms out there. And if our technology can help grow the overall size of that pie, everyone benefits. And I think COVID has really highlighted the need for us to be able to deploy these at a much faster clip. And that's something that the robot arm OEMs are also very supportive of. They know that it is necessary to make this stuff easier to use so that you don't need a PhD in robotics like my co-founder does. Yeah, I, clearly, I mean, I think the benefit's very high. Now, I wanna make sure that we distinguish when we say industrial robots and what that means. Um, from your perspective, from an OS, a capability doesn't matter if it's a robotic arm versus a warehouse robot that's actually you know bringing and dropping off certain uh, you know boxes or compartments, for example. And, and of course, there's various types of you know modalities of robots doing different things. Um, what are you able to actually support from an OS versus what are you not able to support? So today we support robot arms. So the warehousing robots you're referring to, the, the AMRs and the AGVs, that is a whole other class of robots that today we don't support. Who knows what the future holds in that regard, but for now we're focused on robot arms, both the traditional industrial variant and also what are called uh, cobots or collaborative robots, which is a, 
a new class of robot arms that's really emerged in the, the last few years. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about something kind of concrete. I think one of the sectors that we're seeing uh, that's very applicable is the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. So now we have the large uh, auto makers finally really, I think, committing to electric vehicles and some degree of autonomous vehicles as well. That is going to have a substantive impact and change to the way they design their factory floors and ultimately the programming of these robots. Can you get into some kind of concrete case studies uh, in the automotive sector as an example? Yeah, so without naming names, there's a, a large automotive OEM that we're working with that is currently taking some of our products. So we have a, a, an offering called the Forge Station, which is powered by our software as a cobot arm on a, a mobile platform. And they've actually distributed many of these to their facilities in the US to provide a opportunity for their factory floor workers to experiment with robotic automation, much in the same way that they've done with 3D printers over the last decade. Now with cobots and this plug and play software architecture that we've offered them, they've undertaken that same level of prototyping experimenting with uh, robot arms. And one of the very first use cases that they actually identified is uh, robot inspection. So mm -hmm. strapping a inspection camera to the end of the robot arm and then using our intuitive interface, they can actually have the line operators program the inspection sequence so that they can you know, reduce scrap rates and improve throughput and quality on parts coming off of stamping presses. So that's an example of a, a concrete use case that emerged through the flexibility that our software offers and the experimentation that's capable because of that. Yeah, that's interesting because now you're actually integrating it to their QC process and their methodology, such as Six Sigma, for instance. Um, and really, you know, automating and streamlining it. And because it's actually fully uh, digitized, you can actually start to have a lot of data behind that as well, right? Exactly right. And pulling off that data is something that's becoming increasingly important, especially as a lot of the larger OEMs are moving to this world of Industry 4.0, where everything is driven by data. And this creates feedback loops that allow you to improve the efficiency of your operations. Can you give one more example around how some of these companies are using the data for those efficiencies? So a, another example of this is just measuring the overall throughput of a given production process. And this becomes especially important in uh, high mix environments where you see a lot of changeover and you want to be very closely monitoring how fast that changeover occurs, how quickly you get up and running again. And ultimately how much inventory you can move through that process and through offering a flexible programming interface and the ability to capture that data at the same time it allows for a much tighter control loop in these high mix environments that overall improves productivity and thus the bottom line that's incredible from a visibility as well as the ultimate dashboard for decision making support uh, i want to go back to the automotive sector as, a, as an example again just to give the listeners something more concrete uh, so, for example, I think not only Tesla, but other companies that are starting to shift to the next generation of, you know, solid state batteries, for example. And that has a host of, you know, impact in terms of, you know, the way it gets manufactured. I think the, the battery packs and the, you know, components and the modules that currently go into battery packs for Tesla is going to change substantively because of new changes in technology. How quickly are we talking about in terms of being able to get some of these new lines up and running and programmed? Yeah, so this is this is an interesting point overall, right? It's the shortening of the innovation cycle where things are moving more rapidly from the lab to production environments. And the faster you can accomplish that as a company, the more valuable that product can be as it captures greater market share quicker, the more productive you are. And this type of flexibility that we offer is going to be critical in these type of shortened uh, cycles because you can just program them much faster. And for a mainline production in a, an automotive facility, you know, you're typically looking at an 18 month setup time. Now, we have not actually brought any of our technologies into a main line like that. But what I can tell you is we've had several customers that have for individual cells needed to program out a given task and doing the traditional way, they were looking at 40 to 80 hours of integration and programming work. And using our software, they were able to accomplish the entire task in four uh, to eight hours. 
So that's a amazing. 10x reduction that's, that's in incredible. programming and setup. Yeah. Time. Not to mention just the, the savings in terms of frustration, right? Uh, Absolutely. That's, that's amazing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the some of the OPEX that you guys have to handle because you're dealing with a lot of APIs, drivers, and as the manufacturers of these uh, robotic arms continue to upgrade, how do you stay in sync and what's the kind of cost of you know keeping this interoperability at the pl platform level? Yeah, so fortunately, a lot of the OEMs do not update their core software at the speed at which you would expect from something in the PC industry, for example. And because of that, the once we get over that initial integration hump, you know, there's not a ton of ongoing cost in terms of keeping up with their software. You know, they're, they're typically doing major releases on an order of every well, once to three, three to five years. That, that's such a, a stark contrast to, I think, the rest of the world, and I'm sure what you're Absolutely. used to as well. So, um, so in a way, I think um, you know, what you're talking about is essentially defensibility. Because you have incurred the initial cost of the integration, and the SDKs, the APIs, and, and so forth, the hook hooks, that means that you guys are able to supply and support. Um, what's From a per general percentage, what percentage of uh, industrial robot arms would you say you guys already support? So today we support about 40% of the uh, install base out there, but we have a, a new version of the software that we'll be announcing officially in April that is going to carry much broader support. And that's all I'll say for now. I'm really excited to share those details in the coming weeks to demonstrate just how far we've taken the system over the last couple of years. Fantastic. Very excited to hear about that. I want to change gears a little bit. I want to go a little bit more outside of factories. And then, I, and then after that, I want to go even further to space. So outside of factories, we're starting to see robots becoming more common, let's say, in the context of restaurants, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's making a, a coffee, uh, some sort of cappuccino, whether it's a, a kitchen arm that's you know cooking your dinner, your cuisine for you. Um, but we're starting to see that arms are becoming much more prevalent outside a traditional factory floor. What does that mean and how ready are you guys to support that as well? So today, the average cost of an industrial robot arm is about $39,000. But that belies an important trend that's occurring right under our noses. And that's that there are already arms that are of equivalent capability that are a third of the cost. So a FANUC LR made, for example, is $39,000. A Epson VT6L, which is equivalent to that arm, is $13,500. There are even lower cost arms that are coming on the market that are uh, about $7,500. I firmly believe that we're going to see a sub $5,000 arm by 2025 at the latest, if not earlier. And then it's only going to continue to get cheaper. And that's going to follow the same type of growth curve, I think, as we've seen with the PC industry and with the smartphone industry, especially with a unifying software layer that enables a whole generation of builders and developers to become incredibly creative with a whole bunch of really cool hardware that today is just too difficult to hook up in uh, a short period of time. So I see this as just the beginning of a tsunami of innovation in the robotic space, especially in the robot arm space, as people are now capable of very rapidly uh, experimenting with different ideas like kitchen robots or dishwashing robots or bagging robots at your local supermarket. And there are probably people out there dreaming of ideas and applications for this that you and I can't even imagine. And I'm tremendously excited to see what that looks like over the next decade. Yeah, speaking of that innovation, that potential creativity, uh, I think kind of standalone arm use cases is one thing. But when we think about more holistic approaches like you know Boston Dynamics, for instance, there are certainly components that have the robotic arm. Um, do you foresee that as part of that cost structure, the marginal cost dropping down, that at some point it'll become almost like Adreno where we have modules and components and sensors and we can piece it together very quickly. And whether it's just for the arm component or maybe for the entire system, you can actually start to use Ready as an example to, to program some of these things. Absolutely. And I think what we're seeing in that humanoid space is very cool today, but I think you're, you're correct that that's going to become increasingly modular, which will allow for all sorts of new fascinating innovations to occur. 
All right, I'm going to go a little bit more forward looking and, and recognize that you guys are very much focused on industrial arms. Uh, from, from your kind of you know, perspective, uh, when we think about terraforming in, on the moon, and certainly I think we're starting to really outgrow the International Space Station, and of course there's aspirations of Mars, but others think that it's more realistic to have a, a larger, more like a, a livable terraform satellite that circumvents around one of the moons or something to that extent. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, all of these require uh, not just bringing things up into orbit, but actually at some point also creating things. So let's take the example of the moon, taking raw materials, refining it, and then building, taking those raw materials and, 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 and you know, raw ingredients, let's say, or chemicals, and being able to actually start to assemble them into you know, components, 3D print them into sensors and so forth that become systems and so systems. What are your thoughts in terms of the role of robots in general and why it's so important to be able to actually have this agility versus always having to pick up the phone and call the system integrators to get things done? As Mark and Dreesen said, it's time to build. And I'm a firm believer in that. And the modularity that you're describing, right, and that flexibility is going to be incredibly important as we move to the next stage of humanity, which I firmly agree with you. I think getting up into near space is important in creating habitats and the Lagrange points and doing work on the moon. And that ability to produce stuff in space is going to require a significant amount of automation to do it at the scale that is necessary for the ambition of the type of projects that you're talking about. And being able to help accelerate that future is something that I think personally is very important and something that just from a personal standpoint, I'm also just passionate and excited about the idea mm -hmm. that in some small way, we could play a role in helping with that commercialization up there because the just beyond the, the need to produce stuff, you can also start to produce all kinds of interesting things in microgravity environments that aren't really capable of being manufactured down the gravity well. And once you have that manufacturing base up there, there are a lot of asteroids that can be harvested for a lot of mm -hmm. other interesting mm -hmm. things that help bootstrap humanity into the rest of the solar system. Right. And, and again, I think to your point is, you know, it's, you know, I think people sometimes mistake thinking that we could send the workforce up into uh, the moon or asteroid for some of these mining aspects and refinement. But, you know, it's really going to be an army of automation systems that can be really flexible to handle any type of different contexts and atmospheres and environments. Uh, exactly fascinating. Right. Um, coming back to Ready, let's briefly talk about Ready Academy. What is that and how is that equipping factory workers and managers? So one of the major problems in manufacturing today, especially in the US, is what we call the manufacturing skills gap. There are over 500,000 unfilled jobs in US manufacturing, predominantly due to the fact that you need workers capable of performing specific tasks that they don't have the education for through traditional means. We're a firm believer that making the technology easier to use is hugely important in being able to fill that skills gap. But just because you make it easy to use doesn't mean that no trading at all is necessary. So that was the idea behind the Ready Academy was to provide a increasing library of free educational modules that teach you not about programming, although there is some aspect of that, but really about how you use robot arms and all the other attendant peripherals effectively as tools in production environments. So we actually prototyped this over the summer with an organization called the Eastern Kentucky Advanced Manufacturing Institute that reskills former coal miners in Eastern Kentucky. And we took a cohort of 14 former coal miners who had never seen a robot arm before. A lot of them had not even used computers heavily previously in their job. And over a two week period, they went from knowing nothing about robots to being able to run lights out production on machine tools using our programming interface. And these were all bright, capable people. You just had to give them something that was a little easier to use. And I understand that completely. If you handed me a traditional teach pendant for a robot and said, go set that up for a task, I would have absolutely no ability to do that. But using our programming interface, it's actually easy enough that a economist like me can do it with almost no training. 
Yeah, so the, I think the import, importance and the implication of this is actually much broader from a policy point of view. You know, whether it's Brexit or w whether it's kind of general pop populism that we're seeing across the world, it's this notion of, you know, continuing income inequality, people that's been displaced structurally and whatnot. And certainly, you know, I think there is a large group of underemployed, structurally unemployed people that are very capable and can add to the economy to the GDP. And they need something like this to be able to actually make that transition, especially in this climate where I think there's a need for not only domestic manufacturing, but local manufacturing capabilities. Yes. And I think that's a really important message for all of us from a you know, supply chain, but also sustainability aspect. Absolutely. Localization of manufacturing is something that COVID has really highlighted the importance of. I have a, a good friend who's a doctor in New Orleans who has undertaken this as a, a personal initiative to make sure that there is localized manufacturing, especially for PPE. And as things have opened back up again, he's been getting inbound calls from Chinese manufacturers who are offering very, very competitive pricing again. And they're turning them down completely because he says, it doesn't matter if I get this PPE at 15 cents cheaper, if I can't get it when I need it. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't get it when he needed it. When he really needed it, it wasn't available. And that speaks to the importance of this type of localization so that you don't have these supply chain shocks that can completely disrupt these uh, pretty critical industries. Yeah, I think we really saw uh, first person in terms of what COVID did to not just food industries and retail, but also just everything in terms of component, because we're so reliant upon international supply chain and manufacturing that if something like this happens again for a long period of time, it really does actually even affect our ability to protect our nation and our defense. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely right. So I think great topic. Love what you guys are doing. Final question I have for you is any lessons learned, product or project failure and insights that you've gained that you can share with others? Absolutely. And you know, this is something that is increasingly important in the world of hardware startups and with more and more of those coming out. Uh, you have to get your product into the hands of customers as quickly as possible. And that was something that the, our investors challenged us very early in the company to do. And we built some prototypes and we went out there and we started seeing what worked and, and what didn't work. And we had some aspects of uh, this vertically integrated solution in the beginning that we thought were fantastic ideas that turned out to not really be that valuable to the end users. And I'm glad we were able to figure that out when we had uh, you know, a small number of prototypes because the iteration costs, even though they were greater than they would be in you know, pure software play, were still much smaller than they could have been if we had been scaling up more aggressively without getting that type of widespread uh, market testing done. Terrific. So with that, I've been joined by Ben Gibbs, who is the CEO of Ready Robotics. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, Scott. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.